I, I can. Uh, thanks, Lydia. Um, yeah. So uh, before we go too far, I think yeah, just getting everyone acquainted with who we are is the first thing, first and foremost. And I, I want to say we are just honored to be here to speak to you. Um, this is something that we feel really passionately about, and um, we've kind of shifted our entire focus here. So to have a conversation with all of you about this is really, really wonderful. Um, so my name is Daniel Wood. I founded the group back in 1998. So um, that's who I am. Um, and then how about each of my colleagues will just kind of introduce themselves. My name is Lydia Vandriel. I'm the Horn Professor at University of Oregon. And I joined Quadra in 2007. And I'll pass it over to Amy Jo, who was the next person to join. Hi, um, I'm Amy Jo Ryan. I play third horn with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and I joined Quadra in 2000 and, when did I start? <laughs> Not even 2008. 2008. 2008, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adam Munsworth. I teach horn at University of Michigan, and I'm the newest member. I just started this year, first season, and I'm enjoying it so far. Great to be here. Yeah, and we're absolutely thrilled to have Adam join. We, our longtime member, Nathan Pollock, just retired after 18 years with the ensemble. Um, he retired from the horn and also from Quadra, so uh, we wish him well in you know, the next chapter of his life. Um, it, while you're looking at me, you look at this one eye and you're like, wow, it looks really red. It's because I've been gardening all morning and a branch just went and slapped me right in the eye. And so I'm going to be kind of blinking a lot during this presentation. So just letting you know that. <laughs> um, now, if you know about us and you've seen us before, we're really happy to see you again. Um, I saw in the chat that one of you remembers seeing us. Um, play a joint recital with Genghis Barbie back at uh, the 2000, I think it was the 2011 uh, San Francisco Horn Symposium. Um, so we got a chance to meet a lot of you then. Um, but we've been doing concerts um, around the, the country, um, as I said, since 1998. And a lot of those um, th those things that we've done, there have you can are encapsulated in a really lovely summary that the Northwest Horn Symposium put together. Um, which you can find in the packet. So you want to find out more about us, um, go there. And of course, you can go to our website. Um, there is one thing I would like to call out on that um, summary, a bio about us, that I think is really important, kind of critical to this whole discussion we're going to have today. Um, and that is in 2020. So just last year, um, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, we received um, the Hart Prize from the Ariel Avant organization. Um, and that was in recognition, recognition rather of our artistic programming tied to social justice issues. Um, now we're absolutely flattered and humbled to receive such an award. We were up against a lot of chamber ensembles who are doing fantastic work out there. Um, and one of the reasons why we are especially proud of that is because it has come to define all of our artistic decisions moving forward. Um, and this really wasn't by accident. Um, we've been engaged in um, doing programming that's tied to socially informed art um, since our beginnings, um, but we made a very conscious decision back in 2019 to shift our work so that the issues that we um, are passionate about in our communities, that is what drives what we do. Um, so in the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to be delving into that in a big way. Um, in first, we're going to talk about how we made this pivot as an ensemble, as a group. Um, second, we're going to talk a little bit about what has worked and also what hasn't, <laughs> um, because there have been a lot of bumps along the way, of course. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do next. Um, so Lion Chair of our program is going to be talking about all the steps we've taken leading up to our programming in June. But we, of course, have projects and plans beyond that. Um, now, before we go too far, I'd love to kind of get to know our audience a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure how we can do this. 
Um, I, I know a, I can. We have a Q and A function. People can type stuff in the Q and A. Okay. Function. Can people raise their hands um, using the raise hand function? Okay. So how about we how about we do that? We'll all look at the attendees list right now, um, which I see is like forty seven strong, which is super awesome. And go Craig. He raised his hand already. Um, that's awesome. So put your hand down now. And I'm just going to ask a few questions, and you raise your hand if this is if this kind of defines who you are, okay? Um, and this will give us an idea of kind of who we're talking to. Um, so raise your hand if you are, you know, a resident of let's Oregon, say. Who is a resident of Oregon? Okay, we got a few people up there. Oregon, that's fantastic. Um, raise your hand. You can put your hands down if you are a resident of Washington. Oh, wow, a lot more hands went up there. Okay, got a really proud Washington crew. Great, you can put your hands down now. Okay, um, raise your hand if you're a resident of California. Okay. Okay, and then of those, I mentioned those three states because we're all on the West Coast. Now raise your hand if you're coming from one of the other states in the United States. Okay, awesome. And finally, um, raise your hand if you are coming international, like you're you're from outside the United States. Oh wow, great! Got this international contingent here too. Awesome. Okay, Can you put your hands down. Okay, I have a few more questions. Um, this is the, the very interactive segment of this uh, of what we're doing. Um, so I'm kind of interested in finding out what your involvement is as a horn player. Okay, so we all come at this from like different angles. So uh, raise your hand if you consider yourself, and I know we are all students for all of life, you know, we are forever learning. Um, but raise your hand if you're like in um, like middle school or high school, like you're, you're starting out on the horn. We have any folks like that here? Oh, we do, great, fantastic. Oh, really wonderful. Very glad to have you here. Okay, now raise your hand if you are a student in college, um, whether you're undergrad or grad. Okay, wow, great contingent there. Okay, now raise your hand if you consider yourself like an adult amateur. You're out of college and you're just kind of, okay, cool, very cool. Um, and now raise your hand if you consider yourself um, a teacher, you know, you're a teacher of horn. Great. I imagine many of you might have raised your hand several times already uh, with all these. And then uh, if you're a professional, This is what you make a living at if you actually could perform and it was not a pandemic. Um, <laughs> that kind of situation. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and then um, I got one more personal one I'm going to throw out very soon. But I'm I'm very curious because a lot of you have attended based on what we've described this presentation being creating socially informed art. So I'm curious how many of you. Uh, play in an ensemble already that is engaged in that kind of thing, um, that works with some around that kind of art. Fantastic. Oh, great. That's wonderful. A lot of people raising their hands. Cool. Well, hopefully we can say some things that are um, innovative and, and interesting for you all. Um, and we'd love to hear from you, especially those who raised their hands and are already actively engaged in this work. We want to hear your ideas as well, because I think this has to be a very collaborative effort. You know, all of us are working together um, to try to highlight these issues, um, the issues that we find dear to our hearts. Um, and then just so we all know um, in the group, um, who knows who, uh, because this is always very fun, um, since we all come from like different places within the country. Um, so uh, raise your hand if you know Amy Jo, like you and Amy Jo are buds. Okay, cool. Awesome. Great. That's cool. Okay, great. Put your hand down. Okay, raise your hand if you're um, buds with me, like you know me. I usually don't get any hands, so. Oh, cool. <laughs> I got two. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Nelson. Um, I'm like the guy behind the scenes a lot of the time. Okay. Uh, and Adam. Okay. Raise your hand if you know Adam. 
Okay, cool. Nice list there. Now, I, I saved the best for last, of course. So raise your hand if you know Lydia. Oh yeah, the whole screen lights up. Yeah, more most hands ever. <laughs> Epic. Okay, some of you probably caught um, them at the yoga uh, uh, class this morning or the Wagner Tubin session um, earlier. So now here we go. Let's talk about um, creating socially informed art. Thank you so much for um, giving us an idea of where you come from and what your background is. Super appreciate that. Okay, now, as you might imagine, doing some kind of reset when you've been at this for 20 some odd years is tricky. Like I said, we've always had this be a part of what we do, but never like everything. It's, it hasn't like been the foundation for what we do. Um, so we realized if we're going to make some major shift like that, we needed to define it a little bit more clearly. Um, so I'm going to hand the mic over to Lydia here to just discuss about how we did define this project, what we called it, and um, how that kind of helped us um, be able to communicate with all of our stakeholders. Thanks, Daniel. So um, yeah, being in Quadra for as long as I have been, and then um, of course, Daniel was the founder of the group over 20 years ago. Um, we've always engaged in sort of meaningful community outreach as just part of what we do. Anytime we did a performance week, we would um, invariably perform at uh, a soup kitchen or at a uh, assisted living facility, something like that. Um, and we did that because we, we care about doing those kinds of performances as well. But um, we also did it because oftentimes when you're trying to get granting money from a community, they will um, you know, give you money if you also do something like that. So um, our motivations were multifold, but definitely our interest in doing that is very genuine. Um, however, in 2019, Quadra um, with the previous in incarnation with Nathan, we all played a, a week in San Francisco and uh, culminating in a really great performance at the San Francisco Conservatory where we were playing on a performance uh, of the music of David Garner. And we had a great time and we had played a house concert that week. And um, after our week of performances was over, it kind of felt like we had just come to sort of a, you know, double bar, like think we had done a lot of really great things. We're all, you know, friends with each other and we all have um, moved in our lives into situations where we're very busy with our careers, with our families. I don't know how many of you know that Daniel has triplets, which I can't even imagine <laughs> how he functions. But anyway, um, we're all sort of thinking, all right, we've, this has been a really fun run. And, um, you know, maybe it's time to move on. But then we had um, uh, one of Daniel's students' uh, parents was at the house concert, and she was really excited about our group. And she also happened to be a specialist in marketing, like a really amazing person who had worked in major corporations marketing. And she contacted Daniel and was like, you guys, you just need a better website. And, you know, what you do is so important, and you should keep doing it. And so Daniel contacted us all, and we kind of had a conversation and thought, well, maybe maybe we do still have something to give. And, and we got together and had a, this deep heart to heart. And we were like, well, why are we really doing this? What's the purpose? And um, it all boils down to this common denominator that we wanted to do something that was meaningful in uh, helping our communities, building you know, just stronger bonds and, and helping out all the good things that happen in communities. So that's kind of what happened. Um, we decided in May of, of uh, 2019, it's not the 19th century anymore, right? It's May of 2019 that we we're gonna, you know, continue with our work and and really rebrand it as music with a message. And every year we we're gonna think of, you know, one specific thing to focus on. So this year we've been really doing a lot of work with um, the unhoused population. And um, I'm not gonna reveal what our next year is because I think Daniel can tell you all about that later. But anyway, um, it was really fun to kind of just, you know, have this this moment of uh, a pause and reconsidering like what what the point is of what we're doing. And then to kind of as a group make our decision and move forward with it. And of course, um, 
Nathan also was kind of grappling with whether he wanted to keep playing the horn or not. And um, we were all sad to see him go, but we're also so happy that Adam joined on and is, you know, 100% in with this idea of, of music that can actually affect a community in a positive way. Thank you so much, Lydia. I, it's impossible for me to have summarized it any better than that. That was fantastic. Um, and I, I think this is a good time for us to acknowledge um, even more so like the amazing efforts of um, Elizabeth Chung, um, who's on the call actually, because without her, um, our, our group would not have been able to see what we could do. We couldn't have seen what possibilities would have existed. Um, so if everyone could just a nice real round of applause for her, she really is um, a kind of an incredible individual that helps make this, um, you know, really a reality. Um, so, okay, we have this idea, music with a message. Uh, we have this fantastic person behind us who knows a ton about marketing and about messaging and the like, who's helping us kind of craft this um, new idea. Um, and as you can imagine, when you get started with something like this, and it, this is true whether you're an ensemble just getting out of the gate or you're an ensemble like us who had 20 years of experience, um, you have to now let everybody know about this. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the weeds about what we did in order to make that happen, but it, that means you have to get, you know, your board or at least the your closest allies aware of who you are and what you're doing now. Um, you have to, whoever funds you, I mean, we're a nonprofit organization, so we have, we receive grants and the like, but even if you're not in that situation, um, you wanna be able to get make sure the people that support you in whatever way they do, whether it's monetarily or with resources or just time and effort, that they're completely on board and aware of what you're doing as well. Um, we had them let our staff know, we had to make sure we let our collaborators know. And then most importantly, we had to start letting our audience know. Um, and that got kind of um, went out in, in segments, like we would First, we focused on the overall project, music with a message. We created videos around that concept, and then we started getting a little more narrow over time. Um, okay, so that's how we made the pivot. Okay, so let's talk about number two, which is how we worked um, to get lead up to these concerts in June, um, focusing on the unhoused community. So step one, tell everyone about it. Make sure you have got something to say. Um, then step two, you have to create it, which seems like the easy one, but um, it's not. And especially when you're trying to create something that's based on kind of community issues. Um, it's one thing to put a concert together that's all works of Mozart. It's quite another thing to um, suddenly have to put together a concert where you're um, now trying to tie it all together with um, homelessness. Um, that's it's harder to maybe draw the connections. Um, so we're going to talk we the kind of the process we did. Um, one of the first things I would recommend all of you do find someone else who's doing it. Um, so I'd like to turn the mic over here to Amy Joe because early on in our process we realized we needed to seek out allies. We needed to find other people that were greatly invested in this kind of work as well, and ask them what are they doing and and how are they making it happen yeah thanks daniel um yeah as we were discussing um having a, a rebranding um or a rebirth of our organization changing um, our focus and our values to be more community-minded we each of um we each individually thought of people in our own communities who inspired us who were doing things like daniel said what we what we were setting out to do and um a person that i knew um from work was vj gupta who um was um the founder of street symphony um which is an organization here in los angeles um that serves up to 10,000 um, people 
in our community, often I people who have been recently um, out of prison, have been um, um, in stages of poverty or homelessness, um, um, just people who, are, who wouldn't have normal access to a concert stage. Um, and the and an artistic experience um, like we would normally offer to an audience. Um, so I reached out to him and he was a wonderful source for us and has given us a lot of support um, as a mentor um, and um, gave us some some good uh, some good guidance on how we could get started um, with our group. And then we grew from there, um, as well as um, some other organizations um, that I've been a part of in the past where we've reached out to um, schools and communities, um, again, in un underserved, under um, populated, underprivileged uh, communities where we could um, they were already making a difference. So, for instance, I played in a, a chamber orchestra called Iris for 13 years prior to um, my position here with the Philharmonic, and um, they had a collaborative uh, uh, connection with a, a, an academy called Stax Academy um, that is um, probably similar to the um, the thing that the Philharmonic does with the Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles, where um, there's uh, students who can receive lessons and um, involvement in artistic and orchestral and theory and arts classes. And um, so we kind of use these as our guide. Um, we also uh, reached out to um, other mentors, um, for instance, um, Kane, Kane uh, Redis, I'm not, I'm going to say his last name wrong because I have been good friends with his wife who's a horn player. Many of you may know uh, Christy Crago and, I'm, and I always say Kane's last name incorrectly. Can someone help me? Yeah, Kane Thomason Redoux. Thank you, um, who uh, was instrumentally involved in the Sphinx organization for quite a, quite a while. Um, and so he, because he um, was um, in the management on, uh, with them and now he's with management at um, Detroit Symphony, he's, uh, he's currently on our advisory board and has been a wealth of information for us and ideas um, on how to um, implement uh, things in their community um, and how to reach out and make uh, these collaborative um, connections with, with um, homeless shelters and um, food, uh, the soup kitchens, the food kitchens, um, which is something that, we're, that we've always done. Is there anyone else I'm, is anyone else I'm forgetting? Oh, well, there's, I mean, the, yes. <laughs> there, I mean, we have probably the advice of I, I'm, and those are some of the people that um, Amy Jo knows intimately um, down in Los Angeles and around the country. Um, but it seemed like every one of us um, had a, a pool of people that we were asking and we were uh, connecting with. And even those people, we would then ask them for more advice. So yes, absolutely. Um, let, I'm gonna go on to the, um, what I think is the most important part if you are in, interested in engaging um, in socially informed art and is connection. It is all about connection. It is all about connection with you and with that particular issue. Um, it, if you are to do a concert about the unhoused community, you need to connect with the unhoused community. Um, doing it in a bubble where you're just talking about it and talking about the quote, as we heard many times when we were starting this journey, the homeless problem, um, it, it, it's it's not genuine. It's not authentic. It's not real. 
Um, but it was interesting because I think a lot of us came from that perspective of this kind of homeless problem. We thought, okay, well, we can do some good as an ensemble because of that. And I would say that's the first mistake we probably made, which is we kind of got wrapped up in that concept and especially in talking to a few other people and the like. Um, and it wasn't until actually we're, we're out there and engaged in it from in this different mindset when things started to make a little more sense. Um, one of the ways that things started to kind of coalesce and make, um, make this much better um, for us was when we started connecting with the composers that were going to write the music for this new programming. As I say, these new issues inform everything. So this year, it's all about the unhoused community. Okay, so if we're going to do that, what works are we going to play for that program? Um, and we decided as part of another new initiative of ours that we are going to you know, be commissioning um, exclusively uh, people of color or underrepresented composers um, moving forward um, that we needed to find people that were had some connections with um, the unhoused community. So through Vijay Gupta, indirectly, um, we were then uh, directed to a composer named Nina Shaker um, down in Los Angeles. She had worked with the Street Symphony down there and we started conversations with her back in May, 2020. And um, we started a conversation with her and a, a artistic process with her. And in fact, if you wanna learn more about the artistic process, we're going to be doing a conversation with Nina um, and um, the co-collaborator, which I'll introduce in just a moment, this coming Saturday um, at the San Francisco Conservatory. Um, so if you want more details for that, just go to our website, quadra.org, um, and click on tour, and you'll find the link there. Um, so in any event, um, so we are going to connect with music. And so we had to find the people that were inspired by this cause, the, by this issue, like that was their driving reason for wanting to create the art. It wasn't because of a, just any uh, another commission, if you will. And so we decided we were going to approach the music from two perspectives. One, that is to commission composers such as Nina who have a background in it. And two, through a composition contest, thereby opening this topic up to many, many people. Um, we didn't realize the whole how we were structuring this until we already had the composition contest um, for last year. So our contest last year did not have this focus. Um, it was just a contest. This year it does. So if you are interested in writing a work uh, for us um, that's um, on June 1st, uh, we'll have our deadline for next year. So I'll explain that a little bit more in just a moment. But I want to give you guys a preview, a really fantastic preview right now of these brand new works that are written for June. Now, Quadra hasn't even been able to get together yet um, to perform these, but I'm going to show you um, some quick snippets here um, just so you can kind of get a taste for it. Um, so first, uh, let me just show you um, the co-commission who has written this work. Um, so let me share a photo of them. So what you see there um, is um, Ben uh, Shirley and Nina Shaker. Now the two of them are um, the co-collaborators in this um, work. And the reason why is when we first approached Nina, she felt she wasn't completely qualified for this. She had never been homeless. She had never been part of the unhoused community. She felt like she needed to have um, some connection there. And so originally she approached Ben, um, who does have connections. I'll explain that in a moment. And Ben created some work that, you know, some tracks, if you will, that were incorporated into her piece. But then after a time, Nina felt like that wasn't genuine, that wasn't authentic. Um, so after, uh, gosh, I think it was in early uh, 2021, January, she approached me and said, um, would it be possible if we can change this commission 
to now include Ben Shirley and make both of us equal in this project. I will write five minutes, he will write five minutes, and we will both write works that are a um, basically a reflection of the other person. You see, Ben was homeless for two years in Los Angeles. He was a very successful rock musician, got unfortunately addicted um, to, I believe it was alcohol and drugs, found his um, way to Skid Row and was there um, for 26 months. Um, since then, he has um, been sober, clean and sober for nine years. He actually was and has rise to huge heights, writing music for musicians of the LA Phil and the New York Phil. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Fast and Furious series, but the Hobbs and Shaw film, he was one of the orchestrators for that. So he's doing great now, but he has this experience and this was experience that Nina knew. And the two of them had a six hour conversation talking about identity, being very, very open with one another. And through that conversation, they were able to create um, this work that we're going to be premiering in June. Okay, so that tells you a little bit about them. I want to show you just a little bit of the works um, so you get a taste for that. So for Nina, she wrote a work called Recovery Swap. Both of these works are for four horns and electronics. The electronics, for the most part, are conversations, the recorded conversations that the two of them had over those six hours, where they talked a great deal about identity and uh, many other things. And as you can see, um, the tape includes um, the words that are said, who am I is, is having an identity crisis, I'm Indian American, here comes the homeless composer. So this kind of conversation between the two of them with their own separate identities. And then we have um, a lot of extended techniques that we're doing throughout the entire piece. Um, I'd show you more, but I, I don't wanna give things away for what we're going to be doing down the line, so. Um, but what I will do is I will play a short snippet of um, the opening of Ben's movement. So you just saw a little bit of Nina's movement. Now let's see a little bit of Ben's movement. Okay, now, now I'm gonna mute myself because I'm afraid this may not work. <laughs> so let's see. You might have to unmute yourself, Daniel. Nina Shakar, how do you respond to that? The pronunciation of our name is such a big thing. You know, I say my name as Shaker. taste of that. Um, so you will hear more before long, we promise. Um, so we needed to create new work that kind of embody these ideas. And 
through Nina and through Ben, we got to understand what it meant to be unhoused. As Ben so eloquently put in one of our conversations with him, it's it's you have to understand the identity of the individual. A lot of people think that the, the way to solve the problem is to take someone who's homeless off the street and put them into a house. But that they're just because they're an outside person, putting them inside doesn't work. It's just you put the outside inside now. And it just it, it leads to self-destruction most of the time. And so Ben said, you it has to be conversations. You have to talk. You have to see whether that individual is ready or if they even decide they want to. Um, and try to get to understand again their identity. Um, so that was really eye-opening for us because we hadn't thought about um, the issue from that perspective. Um, as I said, we also did a composition contest last year, which wasn't focused on this, but you know, as luck would have it, one of the composer wrote one rather, Michael Calkin. Um, he was um, wrote a work called By Hooker by Crook. Um, which does have some ties to um, those who have very little trying to get um, something from people who have quite a lot. Um, so that work is something that we've also been working on. And there was another work that also won Zachary McDonald. Um, and I'm going to very, very briefly um, share the, the flyer. And this is just for any composers that happen to be out there in the audience. Um, our contest is running right now. Um, and it's due June 1st, and we would love to see as many people apply for this as possible. Um, our season for next year, the um, title is called Nature Calls for Harmony, so you'll learn a little bit more about that in a few minutes, um, but just to give you a, a heads up on this. I put the link in the in the chat also. That takes, takes you to the website for information on the composition contest for anyone interested. Thank you very much, Lydia. Okay, I would like to turn this over to Adam because while creation of the music was vital and very, very important for this uh, upcoming program, um, and these four works are fantastic and wonderful, it was also equally important for us to make a connection with um, the organizations in our community. The main focus with Music with a Message is for us to create concerts that develop em empathy, that talk about hope and humanity, um, and heart in particular with this unhoused program. And so we needed to make strong partnerships with local organizations. So Anne's gonna talk a little bit about the experiences um, from when we got together in October. Thanks, Daniel. I yeah. have some photos too, Adam, by the way, if you want me to put oh, some up. Sure. Um, my first experience with Quadra was this uh, past October going out to Mountain View and you know part of it was just to to get to know them better and to um, have an experience rehearsing and just seeing how we meshed as an ensemble um, and in the midst of a pandemic concerts were you know a little challenging to come by but um, we were able to get a couple of performances that uh, went along with this theme of, of serving the unhoused and is in the San Jose area. So we were out in California and Daniel lives in Mountain View, I'm staying nearby and we're able to spend a day out in two different places in San Jose. Uh, one was called the Bill Wilson Center, or homeless shelter. And um, that was our first performance of the day. And we tried to give them a variety of, of repertoire um, some of our, the, a little bit of the new pieces, uh, Amy Jo played some natural horn, we had some, um, a little bit of improvisation I did, and some alt horn as well. Daniel led uh, the, there we go, there's a good picture of that. Um, Daniel led some of the, the uh, patrons there and the staff. A, a clapping rhythm game to get them involved and we just tried to make as much of a, of a connection with them as possible uh, the staff was there in out in force and were really really appreciative and um, it, it seemed like the, the patrons there were were also quite interested in what we were doing and just happy to have some so a performance and and something that was a you know something different for their for their day and for their experience there um, but 
you know, anytime as you see in that picture, they were able to talk, speak with them, just to, to touch base and see how they liked the, the concert, how the, what they felt about the sounds of our instruments and the different instruments. Um, lots of interesting questions come up all the time when we, we play for people who this might be brand new for them. Um, so that was you know, a fun experience. It was an interesting one. You kind of have to roll with it because right above the Bill Wilson Center is a, is a highway. So it was uh, acoustically a different experience for, for us, certainly. Um, but I think that's the kind of thing that um, in a lot of ways they just appreciate because you're, you're out in their place, right? Rather than expecting them to come to, to you, um, you go out there and you, you serve them in their community, in their area, in, you know, in their, their actual residence. And that means a lot to them. And I think you could feel that. Um, the next place we went, it was a place called Martha's Kitchen, and it was across town. And we really didn't know what we were in for there. Um, uh, didn't know how the setup was going to be and exactly what they even wanted. This is a, a food pantry where people come and line up and wait for food for, for dinner. And that's, we were going to basically be entertaining them, um, during that dinner hour, mostly while they were going to be waiting in line to pick up their their, their food for the for the evening um, and this was a kind of a cool experience we got there we were waiting around to really figure out where we were going to set up um, we had a couple of different options and we chose to set up right in the parking lot we had to, had to af even ask people to move their cars so we could get a good place where people we could be viewed um, there was a gentleman named Dan that we met there who uh, usually plays guitar like I think three four nights a week he would come to the homeless shelter or this food pantry and play guitar. There's Dan right there. And Dan was instantly friendly and was super excited that we were there and started asking us what tunes we knew. Um, one thing that Dan always does when he's there is try to get the patrons to come and, and uh, participate with him. Any tunes that, that uh, they might know that he knows and to get them involved uh, just makes that, again, that connection. So you can see us out in the parking lot playing and Dan is playing guitar. Uh, and we have one of the patrons here. Daniel, can you remind me of his name? You're muted. I think it was Richard, wasn't it? Richard. All right, Richard uh, was actually pretty rocking with uh, My Girl. And we, uh, did we, we may have even done an encore of My Girl after that first performance. He came back and we did it again. And we didn't have a chart. You know, we were basically just what key are we in and, and trying to make up some lines that would work. But um, you could tell like the power that that had basically us being there like, entertaining. People were walking by and watching us while they were stood in line and, and sometimes coming over and saying something. But as soon as they saw us with with sort of their people, the people that they knew, um, there was really a powerful connection there. and. Uh, we got a lot of nice comments and, and people coming over just very, very appreciative for us being there. So that kind of gratification, we just don't often get that in the concert hall. And, um, it, you know, it's gratification that goes both ways. And uh, that connection felt really special that day. I'll turn it. Thanks very much, Adam. I and. It, because we are all in different communities, um, I, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, Amy Jo's down in Los Angeles, um, Lydia's up in Eugene, Oregon, Adam's over in Michigan. Um, one, often we get, how the heck do you make that work? Um, that, that must be a huge inconvenience. That must not help you at all. Um, and actually we discovered, especially when we made this pivot, that that was actually a very positive thing because it meant that each of us as soloists in our own communities could go and start working with different organizations in the communities. Um, and we had every intention actually of doing that a lot this year. Um, <laughs> and then there's this thing that called the pandemic that showed up. So that didn't happen like we expected it to. Um, but we know that every time we're not meeting together to perform and to do the work that we're doing, that we each in our own um, areas can continue that work in the organizations um, there. Um, so it's, 
powerful thing for us to be doing. And it, it also is very important that when you start this kind of work, when you start engaging these community partners, that you continue to do it. Um, uh, Drive-by outreach, as it's been called in the past, um, is, is not the name of the game. We're, we're really trying to seek out meaningful, deep engagement. And that comes from going time and time and time again. I don't actually want to dismiss drive-by outreach or outreach at all, because we've done a great deal of it. And I've seen the power of us doing, doing one concert in one place, one time, how that can have such a huge effect on people. Um, but I know to be deeply engaged with the people and especially around a particular issue, it helps so much if you actually can spend more time there. Um, can I just um, say please. add something on top of that, Daniel? Um, and something that we discussed when we were first making this transition to more social causes is how could four uh, basically white people who grew up with privilege, um, we all grew up in homes where we weren't we weren't going hungry. We always felt safe. We always felt loved. How could we could how could we relate and make a difference? And like Ben was saying, you you don't take someone who's homeless and put them in a home that doesn't change. But more that we had to educate ourselves and continue to make these connections and just um, reach out to people. And um, like Dan was just saying, just to keep keep going there um, and have these conversations that may then aren't always comfortable. Oh. Right on the money, right on the money. I couldn't agree more. Um, I I want us to talk just very very briefly, just for a minute, about some of the other partners we've brought on because we want it to be a multi layered experience uh, when patrons come to our concerts in June. So as part of that concert, these are some of the, th um, let me just show you what our, um, this is the theme um, logo for the concert, just so you can see that, um, which kind of encapsulates um, the, the topic and the conversation we're gonna be having that night. So over the course of that program, there are going to be, um, you're gonna hear those pieces. We're gonna be collaborating with a gentleman named Christopher Grant, who's gonna be putting visual media up behind us over the course of it. And that visual work um, is part of his own design. Um, he's taken over a thousand pictures he's found of people that are um, unhoused and Instagram and then utilize that to create um, images and impressions up on the screen, which is incredibly powerful. Um, but he also is using images that we have um, collaborated with a local um, artist elective. So this is, the group is called um, Allied Artists West and there are 20 painters painted um, work about um, the unhoused community and some of the very hopeful and uplifting things that are happening by local nonprofit community organizations around that. So these are just a few of those paintings uh, for me to share for you all. Um, and each one of these paintings also has a poem that's been associated with, that's been created for that particular painting um, by another group. Uh, let me bring up another one for you. Um, how about this one? Um, this is Karen Marquez did this one who actually is organizing the entire thing. And this is, uh, we have a local organization called the Community Services Agency that provides uh, food. They also provide, um, if you see in the background where my uh, cursor is, um, showers and places for people to clean up. Um, they provide services to those um, young mothers that are um, forced to, flee kind of wholesale situations from homes. Um, so they, they've been a wonderful organization and we are collaborating with organizations such as those um, to have them come and speak at the program as well. So in between the pieces that we are performing, we're going to have actual people from those organizations talking. Some of them will be uh, administrators, people in charge of those programs. Some of them will be clients. Um, those uh, part of the unhoused 
community taking advantage of those services. And we hope that it's going to create an environment where it develops empathy. Uh, it's going to create an environment that just encourages conversation and connection again with the issue um, and with you know what what's happening in our community. Um, at this point, I just want to briefly talk about three. Um, so, even though we're doing all this work and we're going to continue doing it going into the next um, year, uh, we'll continue our connections with the um, community partners that we've made in the unhoused community. We are starting now to uh, reach out to all the organizations in our local area, um, in the San Francisco area, along with our local areas where we um, all live, um, to find those that are interested in having a discussion with us around the environment. Um, so um, as you saw earlier, our composition contest is specifically around that now. So if you're interested, we're going to have two winning works for that. That'll become part of our series next year. Um, uh, Elizabeth uh, Chung was responsible for that last logo you saw of the home and Hope, Humanity, and Heart. And she's also responsible for our new logo, which is in process here, but you're getting a sneak peek um, at what it will look like for next year. Um, so nature calling for harmony. And we are collaborating with, I think many of you will know this name, um, Jeff Scott. Um, he's the um, Horn Professor at Oberlin and longtime player with the Amani Winds. We'll be writing work for us. Um, and one of the things we really benefit from in our ensemble is also having Adam and myself be active composers. So we write works as well uh, for these programs. Um, so that kind of encapsulates where we are with all of this. Um, and I, we're still learning and we'd love to hear from you all. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, Amanda wants to know, what would you say was the biggest hurdle we had to overcome during this process? Um, well, I can speak to that first. And I would love to hear what my colleagues have to say as well. Um, I think for us, it was convincing a lot of people um, especially our board, um, that this was viable. This made sense. It made sense for us to create music that was based on causes within our community. Um, and it's still a little untested, to be honest. We're, I mean, I'm pretty confident it's going to work just fine. But I, I think they, they're like, well, why don't you just one of them, for instance, said, well, why don't you just be like, you know, I remember I, I grew up on the Canadian brass. Why don't you just do like fun, um, silly things and, and, and balance that with doing like virtuosic things on stage? And I, I told them, well, you know, we've done that. And we, we, that was fun, especially when we were younger. Um, but we are now at a point in our lives where this really, really matters to us. And we've Kind of put a stake in the ground and this is what we're going to do. I'm just going to say this is probably stating the obvious but the pandemic was a huge hurdle. We had um, initially the week that we ended up doing in October was going to be pushed back because of pandemic issues and many other things and then again we had the, these upcoming concerts that are now going to be happening in June were initially scheduled for March in California and um, the pandemic was still raging at that point. So we had to cancel all of that. And hopefully everything that we are now planning will actually happen in June. I'm very excited about it. But yeah, pandemic, it's been hard. And if you have other questions, we'd love to hear them in the Q&A or thoughts for that matter. Um, you just have thoughts about the whole thing. while some of you are typing um, busily at this point, we'll also kind of look at the chat and see if there's anything there as well. Um, I, I do want to say that um, one hurdle that we still face, and I think this is unique to every single one of us, is we're French horn players and we're a French horn quartet. And 
or as and I, I say French horn a lot, I, I must admit, and I'm sure some of you are um, perhaps maybe a little annoyed with me um, to, to say that rather than to say that we're a horn quartet. But I find so many times I say I'm a horn quartet and they're like, your saxophone group? So what do you, your trumpet? I mean, it just, it seems like I'm forever having to explain who we are. Um, and so that is part of it too, is to say, okay, we're a horn quartet that is focusing on community causes and we're getting like this double head take, like what, 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 who, what are you? Um, and then, some of it is also just convincing folks of what we do. I mean, even with, um, as I say, gosh, now it's 23 years under our belt, um, we're still getting up there and just kind of showing that, yes, this is, this is a very, very viable medium. And there still aren't that many professional horn quartets in the world. Um, so for that reason, um, I think we still have to explain ourselves. And so we have to explain what we do and then how we're doing it. Um, so there's just a lot of layers that have to um, forever be articulated, which makes things challenging. Um, thanks to all of you for your comments in the chat. It just really, it's nice to hear from so many folks. Thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, I know that we have um, the young artists, emerging artists recital is coming real soon. So I think maybe John is going to come back in and um, take over. So thanks, everyone. Yes, thanks, Quadra. Excellent presentation. And thank you, Lydia, for that excellent transition. Um, I'm going to give a quick note to our sponsors while we all head back over to the YouTube channel to check out our up and coming young artist recital. We had a lot of great submissions and it was very, very challenging for our judging panel to take all of these submissions and whittle them down just to a couple winners um, to fit into our 45 minute time allotment. So we're gonna head over there and after a quick break, of course, grab, grab some water, blink your eyes for 10 seconds at least, and then um, we'll see you all there. And then at um, 4 p.m. Pacific time, come back over here and we will have a masterclass with featured artist David Cooper. All right, y'all, thanks so much again to Quadra. I wish I had reactions on here so we could all do the little clap in the corner, but totally fine. Excellent work, everyone, and we'll see you soon.